Nutrition Assessment and Anticipatory Guidance, a CHDP Provider Training. Objectives. By the end of this training, participants will 1. Know how and when to perform laboratory tests to screen for anemia. 2. Know how to collect a dietary history and assessment of food intake and nutrients using an approved food frequency or dietary assessment tool. 3. Be able to question patients and parents to determine nutritional problems or unusual eating habits, as well as any social, cultural, or environmental conditions that may affect food intake. 4. Be able to provide anticipatory guidance that is appropriate for the child and parents or caregivers on the topic of nutrition and weight management. And 5. Use community resources to encourage and promote a healthy lifestyle among CHDP patients and their families. Obese children and adolescents not only have a greater risk for health conditions such as high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, joint problems, fatty liver disease, and sleep apnea, but also have a greater risk of social and psychological problems, such as discrimination and poor self-esteem. Later in life, those who were overweight or obese during childhood are more likely to become obese adults. Adult obesity is associated with a number of serious health conditions, including heart disease, diabetes, and cancer. If children are overweight, their obesity in adulthood is likely to be more severe than it would be if they were normal weight as a child. Glucose testing is required if the patient has a body mass index greater than or equal to the 85th percentile, in addition to two of the following risk factors. The patient has a body mass index equal to or greater than the 95th percentile, a family history of diabetes, the patient is Black, Hispanic, American Indian, Asian, Pacific Islander, or Native Alaskan, the patient has signs of insulin resistance, or if the patient gets less than 30 minutes of physical activity per day or has a consistently unbalanced diet. Cholesterol testing is required if one of the following risk factors is present. One parent or grandparent has had heart or vascular disease, a heart attack, heart death, heart surgery, or suffered from stroke before the age of 55 years, or one parent has a cholesterol level at or above 240 milligrams per deciliter. Glucose and cholesterol testing should be obtained fasting. Fasting is defined as no consumption of food or beverage other than water for at least eight hours before testing is performed. CHDP requires that you start hemoglobin or hematocrit testing at 9 to 12 months of age, if indicated at 15 and 18 months, always at 2, 3, and 4 or 5 year visits, and as indicated from 6 to 20 years of age. If results from either of these tests come back abnormal, you should arrange for further physical and laboratory examinations. Make sure to screen for eating disorders, dietary inadequacy, obesity, or other nutritional problems. Recording this information on the PM160 is as follows. Glucose and cholesterol should be written in the comments or problems section using screening procedure 3. Make sure to document a justification for performing this procedure, such as BMI above 95th percentile and family history of diabetes. The hemoglobin or hematocrit measurement should be recorded in its designated box, right in the middle of the PM160. Your first step in deciding which screenings are required and which topics are necessary to cover during anticipatory guidance should be to do a nutritional assessment. You should assess nutritional status at each health assessment visit. Nutritional assessment includes, but is not limited to, Accurate measurements of length, height, weight, and when appropriate, head circumference, tricep skin folds measurement, and upper arm circumference. Laboratory test to screen for anemia. History and physical exam that includes a dental inspection. Dietary history and assessment of food intake and adequate nutrients, including assessment of diets and use of vitamin and mineral supplements through a food frequency or dietary assessment tool. Questions to determine nutritional problems or unusual eating habits, such as extended bottle feeding, inappropriate introduction of solid foods, pica behavior, developmental delays in feedings and meal patterns, and social, cultural, and environmental conditions that affect food intake, such as the availability of enough healthy food, such as fruits and vegetables, 
special dietary practices, and the use of food assistance programs. If you determine that a patient needs to see a specialist, such as a nutritionist, for overweight or obesity, your PM160 should look something like this. Follow-up code number 5 is written in column C of screening procedure 1. In the comments or problems section, you indicate the number of the screening procedure, in this case 01, write the diagnosis, obese, and then write the follow-up code in parentheses, right after the diagnosis. It's also important to write the name of the doctor or the program that you are referring this patient to, Dr. Apple a day, and their phone number. For patients who are only receiving anticipatory guidance, there's still a certain way to fill out the PM160. In this case, this patient is anemic. In column C of screening procedure one, you'll write follow-up code number three indicating that a diagnosis was made and treatment was started. In this case, the treatment is anticipatory guidance. In the comments or problems section, you will write screening procedure 01, followed by the diagnosis, anemic, and then the follow-up code 3. Remember, all children under five years of age who qualify for CHDP or CHDP Gateway also qualify for WIC, the Supplemental Nutrition Program for Women, Infants, and Children. You should always check the WIC referral box and write the name of the local WIC program in the referred to section of the PM160. Also, have a WIC informational pamphlet ready to hand to the parent and be ready to fill out the WIC referral form. Why is it so important to provide anticipatory guidance related to information found in the nutritional assessment to all of your CHDP patients? Proper nutrition during childhood is essential for normal growth and development. Slow growth rates, inadequate bone mineralization, and low micronutrient reserves are equally as harmful to a growing child as are being overweight or obese, physically inactive, or having poor nutritional habits. Poor nutrition at a young age increases a child's likelihood of suffering from diabetes, heart disease, high blood pressure, cancer, and other chronic diseases. As a healthcare provider, you have an opportunity to stop the cycle of poor eating and exercise habits. You hold a position that is respected by many, and you are in a unique place to offer guidance and education to a population that may not encounter this information anywhere else. The following slides contain information divided up by patient age. It is important to present as much of this information to your patient's families as possible, and to do so in a way that will be well received and understood by the patient and their family. General topics to discuss with parents or caregivers of children under one month of age include the importance and basics of normal weight gain that breast milk or iron fortified formula are the only foods needed during this period, the danger of feeding infants under one year corn syrup or honey, holding the baby while feeding instead of propping a bottle up, encouraging paternal participation, and how to recognize normal and abnormal stool patterns. Be sure to emphasize the benefits of breastfeeding at least through the first year of life. Offer breastfeeding support, including proper position and technique. You can ask the mother's concerns about breastfeeding and refer her and the infant to the local WIC program or a lactation counselor if you feel this is necessary. Encourage the mother to relax and avoid distractions when feeding and to take care of herself during this time in her life. Adequate diet with sufficient fluids and rest are crucial, as is avoidance of substance abuse. Formula feeding is recommended if the mother's blood lead levels are above 40 micrograms per deciliter. Formula should be iron fortified. Vitamin D supplementation is only necessary when the baby is not exposed to sunlight. The formula does not need to be warmed and should never be microwaved as this can burn the baby. Tell the parents not to force the bottle nipple into the baby's mouth, but to let the baby find it by itself by brushing the nipple against the baby's cheek. Review proper formula preparation and storage with the parents, as well as sterilization of bottles during the first month. 
inform parents of the dangers of lead poisoning during development, and encourage them to avoid the use of imported baby bottles with decals, and to avoid storing formula in pottery or ceramic containers. The infant should be fed on demand at least eight times in the course of 24 hours, or at least every three hours. A breastfed infant may nurse more frequently than a bottle-fed baby, up to every one and a half hours. Depending on the baby's weight, the average amount of iron-fortified formula needed is about 20 to 24 ounces per 24 hours. Inform the parents to be aware of their baby's cues. They should not encourage their child to finish the bottle unless their child is failure to thrive or underweight. Healthy children will decide when they are full. An increased demand for food often means increased needs for growth. You should discuss signs of adequate or inadequate intake with the parents or caregivers. Remind them that solids are not recommended before five or six months, as the infant's digestive tract is not ready. Tell the parents to not put cereal, juice, or any sweetened drinks in a bottle. As with all children, refer to WIC Special Supplemental Nutrition Program for women, infants, and children. During anticipatory guidance provided to parents of infants between one and two months of age, you should reinforce concepts from the last slide, such as normal weight gain, the value of breastfeeding and maternal health, proper formula use, holding the baby during feeding, and identifying normal and abnormal stool patterns. You should also check that the feeding method used is compatible with the family's lifestyle and the mother's work schedule. Talk about breast pumps, if they are necessary to accommodate the mother's lifestyle, and inform parents that crying and colic tend to peak at about six to eight weeks, and what recommended care is during illness. You should discuss growth spurts and the subsequent need to increase feedings temporarily during this time, rather than to give supplementary foods. As the infant continues to grow, more breast milk or formula will be consumed. Feedings may decrease to six to 10 times within 24 hours, although there is a great variability in nighttime feedings. No bottles should be given to the infant in bed. Depending on the size of the infant, average intake of formula is 24 to 30 ounces. Anything greater than 40 ounces may be excessive, and anything below 20 ounces may not be sufficient. Sterilization of bottles is no longer necessary, although clean methods of bottle preparation are still important. Besides enforcing previous concepts, including normal weight gain, benefits of breastfeeding, and the importance of maternal health during breastfeeding, avoiding corn syrup or honey, holding the baby while feeding, identifying normal and abnormal stool patterns, compatible feeding methods, problems with crying and colic, and increasing food intake to feed growth spurts, other topics to include during anticipatory guidance for infants three and four months of age include a decrease in necessary frequency of feedings down to five or six times in a 24-hour period. If the infant cries for more frequent feedings, discuss the possible reasons and solutions. Depending on the size of the infant, the average intake of iron-fortified formula in a 24-hour period is 30 to 34 ounces. Parents should still look for the child to indicate when he or she is full. The infant should not be overfed. <laughs>